Hello, Global Gardeners. I'm drinking hot tea this morning because it's cold, cold, cold outside. Garden in Eden just up the road from me in Denver has minus 8 degrees Fahrenheit right now. I'm a little bit warmer. It's minus 5 degrees for me. That's about minus 20 Celsius. And we might make it all the way up to 10 degrees Fahrenheit as a high temperature today. That's minus 12 Celsius. So it is cold, cold, cold. And so I'm glad to be indoors talking to you about gardening and specifically the focus of today, getting the garden ready for spring because there's a lot that we can do even when we have snow on the ground and we can't actively be growing all the plants we want to. So we'll be talking about some of those things today, answering all of the questions that we can get to in the time that we have, and just sharing the opportunity to be gardeners together on this Monday, or for some of you Tuesday, since it may already be tomorrow. KT says it's 49 degrees in North Carolina. That's about 10 Celsius. So I can't remember the last time it was that warm. This is the coldest January I can remember here in Colorado. So we haven't seen a day above 40 degrees, which is about 4 degrees Celsius. And I don't remember how long this whole last week's been below freezing. So I'm definitely ready to get outside in the garden and get everything ready for springtime. So nice to see everybody here today. And yeah, two gals will be talking about your your garden a little bit later as we move forward. Okay, so some of the things said that I think a lot of new gardeners often have a problem with is figuring out when to do the things that you have to do in the garden. There isn't a lot out there. I love seed packets and so much information is on the seed packet as to when to start the seeds based on your last frost date. But what do you do before that point? The seed packet might say start the seeds outdoors three or four or even six weeks before your last frost date with some of the cold weather plants that we can grow like peas and spinach. But it doesn't make much difference if you can put those seeds outside if the beds aren't ready to go when the seeds are ready to go. And so think about those kind of activities as you're planning your garden, as you're selecting your varieties, as you're getting your seeds, and as you're putting all that onto your calendar or your spreadsheet or whatever you're using to determine when you're going to start the seeds, we have to back that up by weeks and months to get our beds ready for the plants that we're going to put in. And when it's as cold as it is for me and many of you, we really can't get out and do much in our beds, but we can be ready. We can have that plan of what we need to do. I'm a big advocate of preparing your soil in the fall. First off, you're not doing much in the fall in most cases. You get your soil ready. It sits all winter so that when it's time, the soil's all ready to go and the beds are ready to go. But if you didn't do a fall preparation of your beds, then you've got to do a spring preparation. And the earlier that you can do it, the better. Because when we add compost and organic matter to our soils, and after we disrupt our soils by digging it all up, it takes time for the soil life to recover. And it takes time for those microbes to start munching away and eating all that organic material and then making it available to the plants in nutrient form. That time is what I'm talking about when I say do it in early spring, plan ahead weeks and months before you're actively putting the seeds in the ground. Because the seed has everything it needs to start the plant growing. But once those first cotyledon leaves start absorbing the sunlight and photosynthesis sets in and the roots start growing and the plant starts growing, the soil is going to provide the nutrients for the plants. 
plants. So the soil needs to be all ready for those plants. And springtime is the time to do that if you hadn't thought ahead to do it in fall. And I even add more to many of my beds in springtime. I do the primary amending in fall, but I'll throw an inch or two of compost on top of my beds in spring. So that as the snow melts, as the rain falls, as I water, that top layer of compost will gradually incorporate into the bed and it gives extra food for that top layer of, of soil life. And it also helps protect the soil from the sun so that that life can really jump into action. And then by the time I'm putting the seeds in place, they're resting in a, a fairly good amount of rich compost right close to the surface, throw a mulch on top of it, and then you probably don't need to worry about the soil again for the rest of the growing season. So uh, we'll, we'll come back to the, the soil ideas as we move forward today. Masabi Gal says, I prepare my beds in the fall because when spring hits here in northern Minnesota, I have to move fast. Exactly. And that's, that's the problem I have. We go from winter to summer with little or no spring. So if you live in an area with gradual warming in springtime, you can get away with a springtime prep because you, your soil might be ready to work early. February is probably not unusual for some of you. But for those of us who live in Minnesota or North Dakota or Colorado, we have winter and then we have summer in many cases. And so we don't have the time to do that spring prep. But we still get warm days even in late winter and early spring. As soon as your soil thaws out, that's the time you can start working it. It's not a good idea to be digging into frozen soil. When you dig into frozen soil, you're really breaking apart the structure of that soil and really creating some havoc with the, the life and the future of that, that, that soil tilth. So think about that as far as you start your planning process for the soil prep in spring wait till it warms up and it doesn't always warm up in time for many of us which is why that fall prep is important jay humphrey says i've noticed that when i do my primary amendments in the fall and then just do the minimal prep work in the spring for the seeds and plants it seems to be better wyoming does not get a long spring there you go exactly right i completely agree jay humphreys and and the reason i want to talk about it today is because if you didn't get the opportunity to get it done in fall, don't think that it's too late. Don't think that you can't have a garden this year. You still can. You just need to try to be ready for it as soon as possible. And in fall, I'll use rough material. I'll use grass clippings. I'll use crushed leaves. I'll use the the end of season straw mulch, and I'll turn that all into the soil, anticipating that I'll have six to eight months for that to break down before I'm putting plants in the ground. If you wait until spring to amend your beds, I don't recommend using those raw materials. Use compost that is mostly or completely decomposed, and then you can just get away with a, a, a quicker process of improving the soil and getting the seeds into that happy state where the nutrients are available for them. So I like using free material and I've got as much as I can get in the, the fall and that's why I use the raw clumpy material in the soil in fall. But in spring it's the compost that I'm adding to the soil because there's not enough time for the microbes to break down anything other than something that's already mostly broken down. Okay, let's see. Frosty Lone Wolf says, I don't have any spring prep in zone 4B. I have to do it in fall or summer. And so, it, especially in zones 4 and 5, those of us that are getting, getting cold, cold winters, as you anticipate, if you're a new gardener and you're not sure about your garden calendar, put that on your calendar for this year's fall 
as far as preparing the soil and prepping for the next year's plants because the sooner you can be ready <laughs> i don't like working too hard i'll work when the weather's good i don't like working when the weather's cold but come springtime with all the planning and the starting indoors and everything else I really don't want to be spending a lot of time outside if I can avoid it, which is why that early prep really helps make a difference. Desi Way every day. Good morning to you in northern Utah, Zone 6A. You're welcome for all the tips. Starting pepper seeds indoors this week. Good for you. And uh, if, if you saw my video on the super hot peppers over the weekend, that's what I'm doing this weekend as well. I'll be starting some of my super hot peppers. It's still a little early for some of us like in in my zone five my last frost date is is about may 18th i don't put my peppers in the ground until the first maybe the second week of june and so it's still a little early for some of us that have those kind of conditions to start the peppers but uh it's getting close the, the super hot peppers just take a long time to germinate which is why i'm getting started Adam Gronfold, I've started some reapers and ghost peppers in the grow tent. Good for you. Didn't think about the fact I'm going on vacation in April for a week and a half. Not sure what to do to keep them going. And so hopefully, so it depends on uh, the, the soil that you're using. The grow tent might help. A week and a half is a long time to go between watering. And so you might be able to set up a... A, a wicking bed or a self-watering system real quick uh, better idea if you can is find someone to at least water those plants for a couple times while you're gone i've i've left my peppers and tomato plants for two or three days for quick trips in the past and if you give them a little saturation normally i wouldn't say water to the point of saturation but if you know you're going to be gone, you can overwater your plants once, and that'll carry it through for a couple days in most situations. But a week and a half really is a long time, so I hope you can figure out a, a way to get those plants watered or find somebody that might be able to help you with that. Sandy's Garden, I need a refresher on which seeds require scarification and stratification. It's not listed on seed packets. Don't recall. Did you list them on your video? So I did have a video on scarification and stratification a couple years ago, and I did list some of the seeds that require it, and I demonstrated some others. For the most part, you generally can look at the, the seed. If it's a really hard seed, it will probably benefit from scarification. And what that means is you are physically damaging the seed. You're clipping it, you're taking a, a nail file and filing away some of that, that outer shell. You're damaging the seed so that the, the plant that is going to be growing from inside can break through it. A lot of these type of seeds are perennial plants or native plants that are typically going to be outdoors. And so this is a natural process of, of the weather where we have these seeds that have fallen from the flowers outside and they need to be protected from the cold winter and from the elements. And so they develop these really thick, hard seeds. And then come springtime, they're exposed to the water. They might be gnawed on by small animals. That damages the seed and then they sprout after having survived the really harsh winter. That's the basic reason why we need to scarify seeds. So if we collect those seeds and bring them indoors and they're not exposed to those damaging conditions, they might not germinate. And we need to help them out. There, are, there aren't many seeds in our vegetable growing that requires that, uh, the scarification. And in most cases that I've seen, even in the, the just generic seed packets, it will say to soak the seeds overnight or to, to uh, file the seed or to clip the seed. And, and it's more the, the perennial and native plants that it's kind of just assumed if you're growing those plants, I think, that you know to scarify. 
and I, I don't necessarily like seed companies that do that. Their um, Prairie Moon Nursery, I think, is one that's pretty good about identifying the seeds and whether they need the scarification and what type they need. Because there are some seeds that actually benefit from boiling water being poured over them. So uh, you can go online, pretty sure it's Prairie Moon Nursery, and in their catalog, they list all of that. So check that out. And then as far as the stratification, it's the same basic idea. Stratification is exposing the seeds to cold conditions, like in your refrigerator for a period of a month or two, to mimic what's happening to those seeds if they were growing in nature. And typically it's those perennial seeds that would be exposed to cold winters that require that stratification. And so uh, check some of that information out at, at Prairie Moon Nursery and, and see if it answers some of your questions. And then of course, my video also shows how to do that and then discusses it in a little bit more detail if, if you wanna look into that. Dusty says artichokes need vernalization and it doesn't mention on the seed packet. So good thing I saw the video. Uh, and, and, and you know, that is one of those things as you do more and more gardening and you discover that the seeds aren't germinating to the, the level that you would hope they would germinate to. And often as you look into it, you'll find that it's because you didn't stratify them or you didn't scarify them or you didn't soak them or you didn't do one of those things that can be beneficial. And, and it's learning the hard way, admittedly, but hopefully over time as you make notes of those discoveries, it helps in the future. Like pepper seeds, for instance. First time I ever tried to grow peppers from seed many, many years ago, it didn't work out real well. And then I learned about heat mats. And ever since I started peppers using heat mats, I've had almost complete germination every single time I've tried. So it's those little things that, that really can make a difference. And so tying it, that back into the prep for our springtime garden, much of that comes to when we start our seeds. And I've talked a little bit about that in some recent videos, and some of my older videos. As you plan your garden, you have to plan not just the outdoor sowing of your seeds, but the indoor sowing of your seeds. And it may involve a heat mat. It'll probably involve some lights and some pots and a small space in your house to start some of those indoor seeds. We know about the pumpkins and the peppers that need to be started early. But especially if you live in an area that has a really short growing season, you might want to start a lot of other plants. I typically don't start lettuce indoors because my season is long enough that I can start the, the, pep, the lettuce seeds when it's still cool outside and then grow and harvest before the hot, hot summer comes. And there are many plants like that, but I love watching videos from the UK. And in the UK, they're starting almost everything from seed, it seems like. Peas are started from seed. I've never, or f started from seed indoors. I've never started peas indoors because my season is okay for starting this, the pea seeds outdoors. That's one of those things that you've got to figure out if you have to start certain plants indoors or whether you can get them started outdoors directly. And it's that extra little bit of research and experience that helps you determine whether that's going to, to work or not. Ormulus is saying, was looking at seed packets and I see spring or once ground can be worked or after the last chance of frost. And so that's, those are three different things and I think that's why you're asking. And so if, if a seed packet says so in spring, that's pretty vague, but it, it implies that those seeds can be sown when the weather is still cold and when the soil is still cold. And so the peas and the spinach and the lettuce, all those cool season plants can be started in spring. Once ground can be worked means the, the soil has thawed out. It's no longer frozen. Same idea. It's still cold outside. The air temperature might be cold, but the soil has warmed to the point 
that you can start growing in it. And that's a, a way to think about it is to aim for 40 degrees Fahrenheit. That's four degrees Celsius. So I wait until my soil has warmed to 40 degrees Fahrenheit to put seeds in the ground, those seeds that can handle the cool conditions. Because I might still get freezing weather. I don't want to wait for the soil to thaw, put seeds in, and then have it freeze again. When it hits that 40 degrees Fahrenheit, 4 degrees Celsius, it should stay thawed out unless you just live in an extremely frigid area and can expect those late spring freezes regularly. And so it's, it's the choice of seed and matching the plant to your climate and to your weather that also plays into the soil temperatures that you're putting the seed in. And then after the last chance of frost, is referring to those plants that can't handle any cold and you need to wait until the frost has happened. Now, when we talk about frost, there are two different things to think about. Some seed packets will say after the average last frost date. Now, the average last frost date is a 50% date. Half the time the frosts have happened before that date, half the time frosts have happened after that date. So the average last frost date is a good planning factor, but you do need to know your weather and you do need to know the, the expectations of the weather forecast, which is why I plan my seeds on my calendar based on my average last frost date of May 18th. But I don't put those plants in the ground until June 1st, because at June 1st, I have no more chance of frost. And so that's what this is talking about. After the last chance of frost is when you put some of those warm season plants in. I rarely, it has happened here in Colorado, but rarely will we get a frost in June. And so that's what the seed packet is talking about. Your average last frost date is good for planning, but after the last chance of frost means no more frost is coming, the soil is warmed up, the weather is warmed up, and those plants will not be exposed to any type of cold conditions at all. Rob's allotment gardening garden is saying, do lettuce seeds need light to germinate? Yes and no. So lettuce seeds should be sown very lightly and you'll often see on um, a lot of the varieties that they need light to germinate. But you can lightly cover lettuce seeds and they will still germinate. So being exposed to that light and right at the surface, if you, if you sow the lettuce seeds and you just press them onto the soil surface, you should get pretty good germination of your lettuce seeds. If you sprinkle a little bit of compost on top of those seeds or a little bit of, of potting mix or even a little bit of vermiculite, you can still expect that those seeds will germinate. So they they might do better when they're exposed to light, but it's not an absolute requirement. And it does vary a little bit by uh, the, uh, the, the varieties. I actually have some lettuce seeds that I sowed last week that I'm gonna grow hydroponically and I experimented a little bit with this, where some of them I just pressed into the surface and some of the others I, I worked into the soil just very, very lightly. And you can't tell the difference between one and the other. So even though I think some of these say they need light to germinate, what that really means is they don't want to be buried deeply. You, you need, it's such a small seed and the energy in the seed to start that plant growing can't push through a lot of soil. So spread it on top and they need light to germinate. Or, as I have discovered, just lightly cover it with soil. That way the roots aren't exposed to the air when they do start growing. And it should be fine. Frosty Lone Wolf, do let us get long and spindly because I tried growing them from seed and they did. Oh yeah, yeah. Most seedlings can get long and spindly. The light that you're using when you start your seeds indoors 
should be very close to the top of the plants. It should be as intense a light as you can provide. If the light is too far above the plants or if you're growing in a window sill and you're still not getting a lot of daylight, then even lettuce will grow long and spindly if it's not getting enough light. And another thing, depending on how big the plants are, if it's too hot, if you've got your lettuce growing on a heat mat, that can also cause it to grow long and spindly because those plants like cool conditions. And if it's too hot, it goes into bolt mode. They're thinking, oh man, it's too hot out here. I'm gonna die soon. I need to start growing fast and send up my flower stock. So avoid the heat mats with lettuce and try to get as much light as possible. And it shouldn't get leggy in a situation like that. So uh, let's see, scrolling down, Robin's Container Garden. Nice to see you here today, Robin. Find it fascinating that my last frost date in Scotland is nearly exactly the same as yours. Yeah, it is interesting because uh, I've, I've corresponded with a few people recently asking about their, their zones, their hardiness zones, and what they're growing in their vegetable garden. And there, there are some of these things that we, we think have a correlation in our, in our garden and, and really don't. And so, for instance, my zone 5B or 4 in, in Minnesota or 6 in Idaho or Wyoming, none of that matters when it comes to our vegetable gardens. It really comes down to our last frost date. And in, in the UK and Scotland in particular, your zone equivalent for what we have here in the States is pretty close to a seven, I think, which is much warmer winters than I'm exposed to. But our frost dates can be the same even though our winters are so dramatically different. different. And then when we talk about the way we warm up, I am cold, 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 and then suddenly it's hot and it's time to plant. Whereas in most of the UK, it is more of that gradual warming, but it's very gradual. It's cold and it's rainy with the potential of frost all through April and May. So it's, it is interesting to see that we have such dramatically different uh, climates and how we grow, but some of those important dates are the same. And that's one of the reasons why in the UK, I think you all start so many of your plants indoors because it is a, an environment that is so wet and soggy in the spring i can be outdoors and have snow on my peas and they'll do fine but if you have those same peas growing in a, a region like scotland they may be drowned and not do well at all so that's that's why i always think it's important to learn the specifics of your garden climate because it, it can make a, a big big difference RS says, been waiting on non-stratified lavender seeds to germinate for approximately 30 days. One seed germinated, just one. Lavender can be tough to grow. Now, that being said, years ago I tried growing lavender at the Galileo School Garden, didn't stratify them, and got very low germination rates. A couple years ago, I think it's two years ago now, uh, no, three years ago now, I started my lavender seeds here at this house to put outside. I stratified them and I had probably close to 80% germination rate. So I, I put a lot of lavender plants outside in my front and backyard that I grew from seed. And that is one of those plants that can benefit from stratification. So glad to hear you got one plant, but if you want to try it again, stratification can make a difference with that, absolutely. Um, so I also want to talk about the, as the cold weather and what we can do in our gardens. If you're growing trees, particularly fruit trees, now is probably a pretty good time to go out and start thinking about pruning those trees. It's still too cold physically for me to get outside. But as soon as I have some warm days that might appear in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be outside pruning my fruit trees. 
because your fruit trees and your shrubs and your bushes are dormant when you have cold winters and that's really a good time to get out and prune off the damaged and diseased branches start shaping those plants and in, in the shape that you're hoping to get and if you wait until after the buds appear and after it's warm you're going to get a completely different growth pattern on those plants if you prune a fruit tree when it's dormant then the buds that are closest to that pruning cut are going to be stimulated and new branches are going to grow from that spot and that's how you can shape a fruit tree if you wait until after the buds are growing and the the leaves are starting to appear and then prune those trees it gives a completely different growth pattern and it, it gives more of a bushy growth to those particular trees so for structural development late winter early spring when the plants are still dormant is when you want to get out and start doing some of your pruning and so february for me is the time that that i always get out and and do that and, and i've got some videos and in, in past years that that show how i get out and cut my trees and so when we talk about prepping your garden for springtime some of these uh, are these winter activities are good spring prep because it's one less thing you have to worry about during the active planning and prepping and sowing stage of your vegetable garden get your landscape done during the the winter time to include cleanup i leave all of my ornamental grasses in place i like the way they look in winter i allow them to go to seed the birds are feeding on the grass seeds they're feeding on the seeds of all the other perennial flowers that i've left up over the winter but they're looking pretty straggly after snowstorms and wind and after all those seeds have been eaten they're they're not looking good so get out clean up your landscape when it's still cold out so that when it is warm you can be in your vegetable garden doing that type of work and not have to worry about the cleanup in spring cleanup is one of those chores that a lot of us really don't enjoy doing it's necessary pick a time of year when it doesn't interfere with other gardening activities and you may find that it works a little bit better that's that's the way i like to 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 do it heidi says winter sowing methods is a good way to start lavender seeds they automatically get stratification if you live in a cold winter weather area good tip heidi yeah if you if you use the the milk jugs for winter sowing or uh, even you can spread lavender seeds on the ground and in some cases they they will pop up but that, that's a good point and just letting the the natural conditions and the outside temperatures stratify your seeds rather than stick them in your refrigerator that, that could definitely work out pretty well so hey jay always on top of things there's my how to plant and prune fruit tree video link thank you for putting that in there always appreciated shandy's garden said i've got to put more weed fabric down in the walkway before everything starts popping up i've still not done all i want to do with that fabric that's that's a that's another good idea one of those activities before things start actively growing and so if if you're using weed fabric in your walkways and your pathways putting those materials down and then covering it with the gravel or the chips or rock or whatever it is you're using in your pathway that helps smother any of the weed seeds that are on that ground and so if, if you wait until those weeds have started to grow and then put the fabric down and then build your pathways you may be dealing with weeds for the rest of the season but if you can smother them before they ever germinate you've saved yourself some future weeding activities and so i'd i'd like to do a lot of my garden construction in the spring as soon as the soil can be worked as soon as it's thawed out i'm doing the digging but yes like you i think that's a great idea to 
to start working on the pathways before things are growing. And that's one less chore that you have to do when the weather's warm enough that you can actually be growing the plants outside. And I agree with you, Rachel. Organize your sheds. I, I have that on my list of things to do as well. I'm in mine right now and just got pummeled by my grow bags that I had sitting on my seed starting trays. I'll, I'll chuckle along with you. Uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to figure out the best time for me to organize my shed and get it all cleaned up. I had some people ask about that last year, so I'm going to try to do a video to show how I organize my shed. But again, it's just too cold out for me right now. But yes, that's another good early spring or late winter activity, depending on how much cold you can handle. Get your tools ready to go. Get your shed ready to go. Get everything ready to go so that when you need it, you don't even have to think about it. And the nice thing about organizing and cleaning up your shed is you can do an inventory as well. I've got tools that I've had for decades. Occasionally, tools need to be replaced. I have some of my gas-powered tools that I tried to get started up at the end of the season and they wouldn't start. So that's another one of those prep activities. I either have to figure out how to clean the carburetor or take apart some of those little engines and clean them up and put them back together again or maybe take it to a, a, a small business that can do that for me. But it's better to get that done when you don't need the tool than to reach for that tool and then it won't start or it's broken. Take care of all that early and you'll save yourself a lot of turmoil and stress. I guarantee it. Okay, let's see. Uh, I'm going to scroll through. Scroll, scroll through. Lily's saying the frost is freezing my asparagus. Is there anything I can do? Um, don't worry about it. Asparagus is extremely hardy and it can handle cold, cold conditions. My asparagus grows up through the snow every year and is fine. Now, some of those young spears that might have started growing when it was warm and then they're exposed to the freezing conditions, they might be damaged and you just kind of have to live with that. You can try throwing a uh, cover over it, put, put a hoop and hoops over the bed and cover the whole bed with a tarp. You can take some of the big garden buckets, those big black garden pots that you might have, uh, use those. And, and I've done that as well. You just take one of those big garden pots, turn it upside down and cover the young plants when you have some of those freezing conditions. But try not to worry about it too much. The, the plants will, will persevere and grow fine. You'll get more growth when it starts warming up and you don't have all of that freezing condition. But I, I have freezing weather until the middle of May. And my asparagus is typically growing in April. So the entire time that I am growing and harvesting asparagus, it's being exposed to freezing conditions. And so that, that's kind of normal. I, I, that's why I say don't worry too much about it. Jordan Marie Organics, are you limited in any of your gardening activities due to any HOA in your subdivision or city ordinance? I can't have a greenhouse. So uh, that's a good question. So I do have uh, covenants for my area, but the organization that oversees the covenants disbanded 10 or 15 years ago. And so uh, technically, yes, I do live in an area that I would need to get permission to grow my greenhouse, but there's nobody, nobody for me to request the approval for the greenhouse. So no, it's, it's one of these, yes, I am supposed to, but no, there's no way for me to do it kind of situations, which is why I went ahead and set up my greenhouse and two of my neighbors that live on the other side of the fence uh, have greenhouses as well. In fact, one has one that looks very similar to me. I need They just put that up recently and I need to go probably knock on their door and ask if it's the same type. Uh, but that can be a, a limiting factor. If you have a, an HOA 
or a governing agency that requires you to to get approval or maybe it's actually written into your covenants that you just can't have it then it's one of those things that you know, I'm sorry to hear that you might be able to uh, figure out a workaround where you can't have a freestanding greenhouse but maybe you can attach a, a lean-to kind of greenhouse on the side of your house or you might be able to to have a short structure that's no taller than your fence so essentially it becomes like a uh, a, a, a tall uh, box that you can build on the side of your fence to walk into and stoop over. I've seen people actually do that. Uh, I have a friend that has a wallapini and I'm not sure if he, I don't think he had to do it because of his HOA, but it's basically a buried greenhouse. And so it's about four feet deep and the, the glass portion or the polycarbonate portion is only like four feet above the surface. So it's it's really not interfering with the views. It looks pretty nice actually, and it's pretty effective because that buried portion stays pretty stable for the temperature. So you might wanna look at some of those kind of options of burying a greenhouse or, or having a small uh, structure that acts as a greenhouse like we would do hoops and plastic and you might have to get creative in the options if you want to go that route because uh, it it's one of those things that not everybody has the freedom to grow the way they want to grow and depending on where you live and you might need that creativity hi patty any advice on pruning fig trees i'm doing it today come what may thanks um prunes are very forgiving or, or not prunes pruning figs the figs are very forgiving and so uh same basic idea they they can be quite prolific and most fig trees actually grow pretty quickly and so as you're making your pruning cuts anticipate that that's going to stimulate the growth of the buds near where you've done the pruning cut and and make those cuts based on where you want the plant to grow or the shape you want the plant to be in and so when i was growing the fig trees at the galileo greenhouse and they were close to the side of the greenhouse i was making the pruning cuts almost like an espalier where i was having the tree grow sideways rather than getting bushy and so it's just a matter of how you want to shape the tree to determine where you make your cuts and how many of those cuts that that you make but uh, it really is a forgiving tree so if you make too many cuts it it'll it should recover pretty quick quickly without uh, too much of an issue and i agree with um, bobert cronus uh, root the cuttings the, the the trees that i was growing at that greenhouse were actually cuttings from another gardener who had a, the same greenhouse there was uh, another organization here in town that had the exact same 42 foot greenhouse and she was growing fig trees in her greenhouse, did cuttings, rooted them, gave me those rooted cuttings, and that's what I grew in, in my greenhouse. So, uh, I, yeah, that's, that's a, a really good recommendation. Don't just toss those cuttings because the fig trees, that's one of their primary ways of propagation. And it's extremely easy to root those cuttings and get more fig trees, assuming you want fig trees. But... Give them away if you don't want them. They're they're so easy to grow. Definitely take advantage of that. Shanine Hammer, the godmother of one of my children, discovered a prehistoric microbe discovery magazine write-up they thought was a strange small child. Little did they know. Uh, interesting. The Discovery Magazine is a great magazine. I used to get that for years. I don't anymore. But uh, microbes have been around, of course, for the entire life of our planet for the most part and uh that's interesting the prehistoric microbes i've i've read some of that that's being discovered just goes to show there there is there's more life in a typical garden bed than there are stars in the galaxies and so it's it's incredible the amount of life we can have and 
and foster just by throwing that organic matter in and growing the plants because the roots become an important part of that relationship with that soil life. And it's been that way for eons and eons. So uh, it sounds like an interesting article. And Discovery Magazine is a good one to, to read. Empty Nest Gardens. What does the nighttime temps need to be in order to start using a cold frame or unheated greenhouse? So again, it depends on what you're growing. And so the, the nice thing about a, a cold frame or a lean-to greenhouse or a full greenhouse like I have that's not heated is the temperature at night. The, the intent for all of these structures is that they'll, they'll absorb the heat during the day, warm up the soil, and then that warm soil helps the plants through the cold night. And that that closed structure, you close the cold frame or you close your greenhouse doors and that helps hold the heat in. For most of those structures, you're only gaining maybe five or six degrees Fahrenheit, maybe only two or three degrees Celsius. And so you still have to choose plants that can handle cold conditions. And so Generally, when the, the nighttime temperatures are staying above freezing or right at freezing, then you can use these structures and grow lettuce and spinach and peas and plants that can be exposed to frost and still do fine. But because they're now no longer being exposed to frost because of, of these structures, they'll grow faster and they'll grow better. If you want to be growing the warm season plants like eggplant and melon and pepper and tomato and squash, if you want to start those kind of plants with a cold frame around them or even in a greenhouse, you still need to look at your nighttime temperatures. And the nighttime temperature in that structure really shouldn't be dropping below 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius. And so that's about the point that I still look at. If, if I'm trying to keep my greenhouse above 50 degrees Fahrenheit, then as I have it set up right now as an unheated greenhouse, the nighttime temperatures can't go below 45 degrees Fahrenheit because I may gain an extra five degrees, but not much more than that. And so look at the plant, look at what cold it can accept without serious damage, and then add that little bit of a fudge factor based on what the actual nighttime temperatures are and that might help you determine when you can do a cold frame or or some other type of covering to to boost that temperature now there are ways that you can improve that protection so by itself a, a cold frame might give you that five degrees fahrenheit but if you take a jug of water and stick it into that same cold frame, the water is going to absorb the, the heat during the day and release it at night. And you might gain yourself another couple degrees. If you can put electric Christmas tree lights in it, you're going to get even a bigger boost. So if you can provide some supplementary method to get heat into that system, then you can start adjusting that buffer. And so I'm hoping at some point to, to put a, a solar panel on my greenhouse that will power a battery and that battery will provide some heat or actually will, will, will energize a heater during the night and my unheated greenhouse now becomes a heated greenhouse. Once you have a heated situation, regardless of what kind of system you're using, you measure your temperatures see how cold it gets, and then use that as your determination of when to start and what plants to start in that cold frame or greenhouse. Soil and margaritas, thank you for that super sticker contribution. I appreciate it. Glad that you're here today. Thanks for participating and helping support the channel. I, I really do appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, okay, how I win the lottery says worm compost videos on my channel under gardening. So I uh, check out, I've got my worm 
videos as well. And I'm actually working on a new one. I just bought a, a new bin and I'm going to try working on a new method of harvesting my worm castings. So this is a this is a good time of year. And actually, in conjunction with our, our overall theme today, if you don't have a worm farm, if you aren't doing vermicomposting, now might be a good time to do that as well. It typically takes a couple months for the worms to take the food and turn it into the usable worm castings. And, and I mean a quantity. They, they'll eat their, their weight in, in two days, basically, of food. And so they'll keep eating and they'll keep pooping and they'll keep producing those worm castings. But if you have a bin of worms, it takes a couple months for them to eat through all the bedding and the food and then for you to use those worm castings. Well, worm castings are great to mix into your potting soil. And if you're making your own potting soil like I do, and I encourage that you do that, get worms and start creating your own worm castings rather than spending, I think, way too much money for worm, for worm castings. You can take the money that you would spend to buy a bag of worm castings and instead buy a pound of worms and start vermicomposting and producing your own uh, worm castings. And in a couple months, those worm castings will be ready to add to your potting soil. And for me, it's about two months from now that I'm going to be using potting soil to grow all my plants. So winter time, worm farming, they go hand in hand. Empty nest gardens. Thank you for that super chat. I appreciate it. Thank you for such a thorough answer to my question. You're the best. Well, you're very welcome. I'm glad I can help. And thank you for helping to support the channel. I, I do appreciate that. I appreciate you all. And I, I love the opportunity to answer the questions and help you on your garden journey. Britt Lee watched a solar greenhouse video yes, yesterday. Plan to do that too. Looks amazing and efficient. Yeah, the, the solar options when we're, we're talking greenhouse. At the Galileo Garden, we had solar panels that uh, powered our ventilation system. They powered the pump that was in our um, big pool of water. It was also an important part of keeping the greenhouse warm. Now, of course, if the sun's not out, those solar panels aren't operating, but it can be a very effective way to manage some of those extras that are nice to have in the greenhouse. And I'm also planning on putting in a ventilation system in my greenhouse powered by the solar. So uh, look for those videos. You know how I am. You'll definitely be able to do it. And, and so um, Sherry's wondering, what are your recommendations for an indoor worm farm? So I've got a, a series of videos that show you how to start a worm farm and how to feed the worms and how to harvest the castings. So you can check my videos because there's a lot of information there. I'm sure Jay is already starting to look up the links to those. <clears throat> it's, it's simple. I just use a plastic tote and put the the food into it along with the bedding, put some of the, the worms that are specifically intended for a worm farm, like the red wigglers, that's what I use. And it's as simple as that. It's just bedding and food and a container, and you can start with worms and start collecting the castings. But check out those videos because there's a lot more information about having a worm farm. It's easy, it, it really is, uh, but there are some important steps to consider when when putting it all together. So, Sherry, check out those videos, and I, I think it'll answer all the questions you have about worm farming, which is actually a fun. I think I mentioned a week or two ago that uh, my one granddaughter, both granddaughters like, but one granddaughter in particular just loves going down and seeing the worms in the, in the bins because they're just always crawling. There's just so many of them, and... Uh, last time they were here, I actually let them feed the worms. I had everything ready to go, and they dumped the, the food into the worm bin. So a great option if you've got kids to get them involved with some of the gardening as well, if they like the worms and the bugs. And my granddaughter definitely does like the worms and the bugs when it comes to that. Uh, and so good question, Greg. Greg's wondering, anyone know what temperatures they can handle? 
I can't leave outside but wondering about a garage. And so the the thing about these worms, and, and when we talk worms in general, there are basically three different types of worms. There's, there are the worms that dig, burrow very deep into the soil, and so they're not adversely affected by the temperatures of our soil. When it gets cold, they just go underneath the frozen soil. There are worms that are kind of an intermediate worm that will only burrow a foot or two deep. If you're digging, and I see this every year when I'm amending my beds, if I do it in springtime, they'll be curled up into a little ball and they bury themselves a, a foot or two deep and they can handle some really cold conditions when they're curled into that little ball and they're basically hibernating in the soil. And then you've got the third type of worm that only lives in the top couple inches of soil. And those are the composting worms because they're not burrowing deep. They're feeding and living their whole life in just a couple inches of material. And that's why they're so efficient at vermicomposting and eating all of our kitchen scraps and giving us the worm castings we want. But because they only live in those top couple inches, they don't have those same protective mechanisms. And when it gets too cold, it can kill them. And so basically room temperatures are the ideal temperatures for those kind of worms. If it gets much colder than 60 degrees, about 15 Celsius, or if it gets much hotter than about 80 degrees, 26 Celsius, they start slowing down. And if it goes outside those ranges, it can actually kill them. And so when we are talking about a worm farm, that you're doing your own composting with worms, we're talking doing it in a warm enough area that they're not going to ever be exposed to freezing conditions or frost or even the temperatures of, of 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius, that's cold enough to kill a lot of these red wigglers and similar worms. So if your garage is heated and you can keep it warmer than that, then you can have the, the worms in your garage. But because I do it in just a tote, the, the, you know, the, the size of a plastic bin that you would store Christmas decorations in, I just have it underneath the tables that I'm starting my seeds and have the seedlings growing under lights. I've got my bins underneath those tables. So you really don't need a special space, just a corner somewhere, and you can start having your worms. That'd be a, an important part of your garden. Mr. Dude Games, I can't really start my peppers and tomatoes yet, but I've been having fun doing germination tests. Cool. I have eight-year-old parsnip seeds that appear to be good still. Short shelf life seed can be surprising. That, that, that is a fun experiment. I did a video on that a couple years ago where I was testing some of my old seed. And I, I am always surprised at how well the seeds can hold up. You, you'll see the official, and I talked about that in, in one of the videos last year, I think it was, about how long seeds last. You'll, you have your lists and you have your recommendations from different sources that say a particular seed will last three years or a seed will last five years. And the most of the root vegetables like beets and parsnips fall into that general range of three to five years. But what that really means is percentage of viability. And so if you have saved seeds for three years, and the seeds last for three years, that basically means three-year-old seed should give you probably 80% germination. Past that point, the viability starts dropping. That doesn't mean those seeds won't germinate. It just means you're not going to have this high a germination rate as you would with fresh seed. So yeah, those are great experiments. I love doing stuff like that with an eight-year-old parsnip and seeing that they can still germinate go for it. And, and that's another one of those fun science projects for, for kids to actually graph some of that and see what the results are. And it just goes to show that what we learn in our own gardening journey may not match what others are telling us. 
because what the others are telling us, and I fall into that category too, I'm an other that's telling you things. It's based on our experience and general information. And so we tend to, to kind of cut off the edges and average out the recommendations that we're doing because they fit most people most of the time. But you can figure out for yourself that some of this general information really is that, just general. And the specifics are more fascinating and really can take your gardening to another level. And I still have seeds that are years and years old past the point that they're supposed to be good. And I save them and I still put them into trays and do germination tests because though I might not get 80 or 90% germination, even 30% germination is better than tossing those seeds and getting nothing. So that's kind of the way I like doing it. Gardens happened, tested a few different, was doing a seed germination test. And so that, that's another one of those things. Uh, in fact, I think the video I, I did on how to test the seeds and how long seeds last, I think I did that video back in February or March. And that's a wintertime activity. If you aren't sure about your seeds, go ahead and do a germination test now. Figure out if those seeds are going to be good enough for you. And if they're not, if they don't sprout, if they are dead, you still have time to buy those seeds that you want to put into your garden. Or if you discover that they are viable and they're still good, you've just saved yourself having to buy new seeds to go in your garden. So yeah, that's that's a, a wonderful prep for spring is to do germination tests. I, I definitely like that idea. Uh, Brian saying grow bags are great worm bins for outside, not so much for inside. They dry out too easy. You, you know, and, and you can definitely do what Brian's suggesting. You can move your worm operation inside and out and from one container to another based on the time of year. So yeah, absolutely. You could have worm bins outside in grow bags. And then when the weather starts to cool down, you harvest all the castings, you take all those worms separating from separated from their castings and move them inside and then do indoor worm bins through the course of the winter. So uh, yeah, their flexibility can definitely be a good thing when you start looking at that kind of stuff. Robin saying, I always test the germination of any save seeds. I've squirreled away from things I bought at the supermarket during the winter. There you go. I, I, I won't say that I always do it, but that is a great habit to be into. Um, it hasn't happened often, but there have been some years that I assumed the seed was good and then just sowed it directly into the garden and had terrible germination rates from that old seed. So that's why it's a good habit to get into to actually test the seed and see if it's something that, that it's worth your effort. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about the background today. This comes from Gail Sassin, and it looks like she's on the, the live chat today. And so I, I had asked you all for some winter pictures of your garden, and this is Gail's winter garden, and I love it. There, there are a couple things that, that I do want to point out that I always like pointing out is as we learn from other people's gardens. First off, you can see the fencing. And I've mentioned this in, in photos in the last couple of months. When you see all the trees that are this thick around a garden, you have to assume that you've got garden pests like deer and the other forest animals that might be coming into your garden. The fencing here with the wire all the way around it helps keep out some of those pests. But one thing that I think is important, and, and Gail's probably discovered this if, if they do have deer, that deer can jump a short fence. And this looks like it's probably a four foot fence. But deer like to land into an area that they don't have to worry about breaking their legs. And so by placing all of your beds right on the edge of the fence like this, it really deters 
the deer from jumping into the garden. This, this is the method I used in my last house where I had a pretty serious deer problem. I had low fences around my garden area, but I had raised beds just inside those fenced areas, and the deer never jumped those fences to come into my garden because they would have had to land on a raised structure, and they just don't do that. They'll keep walking. So uh, I, I really like that, that design of having the beds and having the, the fence close to the beds because it really can keep those deer away. In the back, you can see some trellising for the tall plants. I think that's great. There's some smaller trellises, the, uh, the straw that's probably standing by to be used as mulch. There's some um, smaller teepee kind of trellises. So lots of vertical growing going on. I love that. But I really like the design of the beds. And so you can see that there's all these raised beds, wooden raised beds, mostly in squares. And uh, lots of advantages to raised beds. I love my raised beds. But what they've done is they've put these circular beds, these round metal beds, in the wooden raised beds. And the reason they're doing this, and I love this idea, is they'll be growing plants inside the, the ring, but then they're also going to be growing other plants on the outside of the ring. And so this is, this is really a nice way to separate the plants that you're growing, but to also focus your planting. So you put your primary plants like your peppers and your tomatoes and all of the squashes and whatever you're growing in the primary growing area, like the round metal beds. And then on the outside, you put a lot of those other plants that I always talk about to attract the beneficial insects and the pollinators. And it's, it's a smaller space, but around each of these raised beds, there's plenty of space to grow herbs, to grow flowers, to grow lettuce and spinach, to grow garlic. There's just a, a really good opportunity to, to have a separation of plants, but still choose plants that can work well together based on their sun requirements and based on their water requirements. And I think it, it just, it, it's got a visual impact as well. The circles and the squares as part of the garden design is, is really, really pretty cool. So I, I really like this garden. And then of course, you've got the sitting area just directly over my, my shoulder here. You've got the table and the chairs. And I think every garden should have at least one place to sit. So. Thank you, Gail, for sharing this today because I, I really do think it, it is. And, and I see uh, up here that Britt Lee is saying beautiful garden. Yeah, this, this just goes to show that even though the whole thing is covered by snow, it, it's clear this is a beautiful garden. It's really well designed and you've really done a good job putting all the pieces together. And uh, it, it, it's, it's beautiful without any plants growing in it. And uh, winter gardens, I think, definitely can be beautiful. I, I, I love my garden in winter because of the same structures and the way I've put them together with that design element and the, the repetitive aspect of these, these beds. You've got the, the round square, round square, round square, and then this one looks like it's just square and on the other side it repeats with the round square round square so i, I love those kind of de design elements so thank you for sharing that with me I, I do appreciate it and hopefully we've given some ideas to everybody else of things they might want to to try out so it is gorgeous and ladies garden at home i agree it's the the snow is is pretty to look at as well Okay, so Ignacy is asking, do you trust long-range weather forecasts? My current forecast is saying this year's last frost is a week early for my main garden area and about two weeks early for the other area. Um, honestly, I don't trust and I don't modify what I'm planning to do based on long-range weather forecasts. But that's because I live in an area that is so extreme with ups and downs 
that can happen from one day to the next that even our short range forecasts aren't always accurate. Last week, we had a day with no snow forecast and we got snow. We had another day with snow forecast and we got no snow. And so I'm just used to living in an area where it's difficult to figure out the short range forecast, let alone any validity to the long range forecast. Now, that being said, there are regions like I talked earlier about the UK, completely different weather patterns. And so in an area where you have a more stable change of seasons, then the long range forecast is maybe a little more accurate than it is in my area. Uh, but depending on how far out you're talking, so I'm guessing the, the long range weather forecast you're, you're asking about is a couple months away. I would be hesitant to, to modify my planning by two weeks just because the weather forecast says that it's going to be two weeks early. But that being said, you can go ahead and give yourself a buffer. If you're starting seeds indoors, maybe start your seeds a week early. And worst case scenario, that two week forecast is wrong and you're only one week off from your normal plan. If that two week forecast is accurate, you're still only one week off from what, what the plan would have been. So you can modify what you're doing, but I wouldn't put all my eggs into a single basket and trust that the, the long range forecast is, is going to be something that is that accurate. Here in the States, we have the, the farmers, old farmers almanac. And for over a hundred years, the farmers almanac has been predicting what the weather would be long range. So they'll actually print the almanac months and months and months before it is forecasting the weather conditions. And historically, I think it works out to be correct about 50% of the time, which is chance. If I say, oh yeah, next winter is going to be really long and I'm right, well, then everyone says, boy, you have tremendous long range forecasting skills. If it's wrong, they say, wow, you were completely off. And if I repeat that with the following year saying, it's going to be really, really cold. Well, half the time I'm going to be right and half the time I'm going to be wrong. And so that's kind of what happens, I think, with a lot of these long range forecasts is they're built on models that may or may not be accurate for some of these short term weather patterns that come in. And half the time they're going to be right and half the time they're going to be wrong. So you can buffer that by kind of splitting the difference and and change your plan by a week when the forecast calls for a two week modification. That's kind of the way I look at it. Eco ecocentric homestead long range forecast laugh out loud that can change a dozen times before the day it gets here. Absolutely. And and so that's why I I don't put a lot of credence into what actually is going to to happen. Shandy's garden says winter sowing is a hit and miss, so mainly do it for flowers now. So <clears throat> I I've, I've mentioned before when I was in the Air Force and was running the flat operations at the Air Force Academy and the the weather forecasters were actually part of my organization and I spent a lot of time with them. They were incredibly accurate. 90% range, which is really good in the in the weather forecasting world. But long range, if it got outside three or four days, their precision dropped dramatically. And none of them would even attempt to forecast beyond about two weeks because it, it's just so unpredictable in a region like mine. And it all depends on your region as to how accurate it might actually end up being. So Frank says the 10 days before the December 22nd freeze was utter chaos in Galveston County with a 15 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about minus nine Celsius. So uh, Lars saying El Nino's and La Nina's 
can really affect winters in the Midwest. And, and I have learned a bit about the El Nino and the La Nina. That's all about the ocean warming or the ocean cooling and how that affects weather patterns. And, and there is some historical meteorological data that supports the La Nina or La Nina and uh, the pattern. I think, I'm not sure, I think we're in a La Nina pattern right now um, and, and how that works. And then the varying El Ninos. Uh, yes, generally here in the US, we've seen those patterns and they've been fairly accurate. But not within a two-week range. It's it's you know months ahead of time for it to say that I'm going to have my last frost date two weeks earlier or two weeks later. Even the the current patterns we have and the studies that that are related to them aren't that good. So uh, dusty flats the, says apparently the jet stream pattern is what they look at and it's showing more polar vortexes coming. Yeah, and and so same kind of thing. I'm expecting more polar vortexes but if someone were to say that we're going to have a polar vortex in the middle of march i would say yeah i'll i'll wait and see when it really does happen it's it's the idea that we'll have more polar vortexes but it's really difficult to plan exactly how far out and how many we're going to have so i i look at the weather every day i'm tracking my own weather which is why it was 11 or minus 11 when I woke up this morning it was one of the first things I looked at. That's about minus 24 Celsius. Uh, but it's more just to see what's going to happen for this week in my garden and what I'm going to do this week rather than really trying to go much farther out than that. Robin's Container Garden says, My grandpa, who was a farmer and spent all his time outdoors, was a better weather forecast than any weatherman on the telly. Yeah, I, I, and, and that's 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 what the way I look at it. You will do better figuring out what the weather's going to be in your garden. When you track the weather in your garden and live the weather in your garden and start observing those patterns year after year. And last year I started my, my pepper plants out in my garden the middle of June almost two weeks later than normal. And that's because I was observing my patterns and checking my soil temperature and recognizing that last year was gonna be a different kind of year. That's the way I think we all have to do it, is not relying on what the forecaster on the telly is saying, but what we can observe and what our own experience has taught us. So it really can make a difference. <laughs> And Nick has some good advice. My best friend who broke his femur knows the weather better than the Weather Channel. Yeah, those achy bones. I'm, I'm trying to, to identify that. I noticed last year a couple times where my, my bones and muscles ached a little bit more. And it, it was that, that thought, hey, I'm old now. Maybe I should start trying to figure out a correlation between which bones are hurting and what the weather is going to be like in the next couple of days. So always fun things to, to learn. Mornings at the allotment. I'm in the south of Germany and it's been colder than usual here as well. The extent of it is minus C though. That's almost, that's a toasty day for me. If not 14 degrees Fahrenheit is minus 10 C. I have enough covered indoor growing spaces to extend the season though. That's, that's a good way to do it. And that's exactly what you learn when you figure out your weather patterns and figure out the cold and figure out what you can do is do exactly that. That's a good suggestion. Start figuring out your covered areas, your indoor spaces, how you can extend your growing season. And that's the buffer. That's one of those things that if it gets colder than it's forecast to be, well, you've already got everything ready to go. So you go out and, and, and cover the plants because the cover is ready to go or they're already covered so you don't need to worry about it you know that's that's the kind of thing that those of us in cold regions really learn to do well this last year particularly in texas and florida that got zapped with some crazy cold cold weather well they're not used to it so they didn't have that protection set up 
they didn't have a lot of those mechanisms in place. If you look at Scott Head's channel on YouTube, he shows you all the damage that was sustained in his garden because they don't normally get those cold temperatures. So they weren't able to protect all the plants like the rest of us have learned to do. So even in Germany, when it gets colder than normal, you can still do a lot of what you wanna do, like you pointed out, by being prepared and noting what you can do in the different areas of your garden. So I'm, I'm ready for the warmth, but I also recognize that there's things that I can, I can still do in, in the cold. And so one of the other things I wanna talk about when we talk about prepping the garden in the cold is, is something like in Gail's garden here, the beds. I've, I've done a lot of building of beds and building the pathways and building of the garden space during those cold months. Like we were talking about the, the pathways and if these beds intrigue you, you can go ahead and do that before anything is growing because what else are you going to be doing with your time if the weather's warm enough to get outside? So think about some of those projects. I have some definite big projects that are planned. I think I mentioned last week, maybe it was two weeks ago, that I'm planning on doing a fence around my garden because Mala is just eating too much of the, the harvest before I can get to it. And, and the gophers are gone. She dug up all the gopher holes, so I'm not expecting the gophers to come back, but I don't want her to be digging up any of my other low-lying beds. So I love her, but she has been a bit of a nuisance in part of my garden. I'm going to put a small fence around it. A fence a little bit shorter than what you see in the background here today. That's the kind of activity that can be done before you're growing plants. I'll dig the holes, put the posts in, build the fence, all before I even start sowing my first seeds. That way, it's done, and I can focus on the seeds and the plants without having to worry about those major construction projects. And so look for the, the visuals of my garden to change. There's another area where I've got my pollinator garden. I want to have some shade plants growing. My whole yard is in the sun all day long, every day. But there's a couple spots, if I were to put up a fence, I could cut down on the amount of sun that the plants get and grow some shade-loving plants. So I'm planning some fences in that area of the garden where I've got the, the pollinator perennials right now. I'll put some border fences up, and I'm talking like six-foot-tall solid wood fences so that they will cast shade so that I can grow some plants that I can't currently grow right now. As you're looking through the catalogs and, and reading the books and the blogs and you come across a plant that you would like to grow but can't because it doesn't match your area, create a microclimate. Put some kind of structure in place that would allow you to grow some of those plants that, that you might want to grow. And so that's also one of those activities that you can do during the late winter or early spring as part of your prep is put some of those structures in place and then you can start growing those plants right away as soon as the conditions warm up to allow you to do that. So lots of fun, lots of good opportunities if you like getting out and doing it. Dusty says fence is a must. If that isn't enough, add a solar electric fence. And so I had a solar electric fence a couple houses ago when we lived in an area with, um, uh, it wasn't for the deer, it was actually for the horses. We had horses and had to keep them in the, the, the areas that they were roaming to. And of course, the solar electric fence is a good idea. I'm thinking about putting a solar electric fence around for the deer. If I have a deer problem this year, like I had last year, I think I may need to do something and I might actually have to string some wire. I don't like the idea of doing it. I'm not sure what my neighbors will think about that, but I have had that thought, at least around my fruit trees, of stringing up an electric fence. Um, tall enough that it wouldn't bother Mala, 
but if the deer are roaming through they might get a shock and quit eating my fruit trees so we'll see i'm i'm not so sure about that yet that's uh, that's more work than i'm ready for because i've got all the other things that i want to be doing 40 54 cows asking are growing pink ox heart again and uh, are trying a different uh are you asking if I'm growing the pink ox heart again or trying a different variety? So I am not growing pink ox heart this year. It's been probably five years since I grew pink ox heart. I am trying a whole bunch of different varieties of plants. And I'm going to probably be doing a video. Someone was asking about that yesterday. I'll be doing a video here in another month or two probably. And I'll be talking about all the different varieties that I've chosen to grow for this upcoming year. But Pink ox heart is not on my list this year, um, though it, it, it is a, a good one to grow. So if you're growing it, um, definitely go for it. Um, and Coastal Crocus is wondering what my choice is for the single seed challenge. I think I'm going to probably do one of my super hot peppers. I think it might be the purple Carolina Reaper, which comes in at 1.6 million Scoville units. And so... Uh, because that's such a unique plant, I'm thinking that that'll be the one I choose for the, the single seed challenge. But I haven't completely decided on that yet. For those of you who don't know, I've got a couple of videos on the single seed challenge. This is also um, Scott Head has videos on the single seed challenge. And it's an opportunity to choose a seed and then track it during the entire growing season. Get your focus on a single seed that grows into a single plant. And you really can learn a lot about gardening by just focusing your attention. Too often we look at the garden as a whole and wonder why things are going wrong. But if you bring your focus down to a single plant, sometimes the answer becomes obvious. And I, I really like Scott Head's Single Seed Challenge. It's definitely something that I would recommend everybody do. So check out some of my videos or some of his videos for more information on that. And, and as we... Talk about growing a specific seed or anything in our garden. This is a time of year that I, I was actually distressed this week to, to see a pretty big seed company. It's a seed company uh, that provides live plants and seeds as well. And I, I get the, the email. So if you go to any of these online nurseries, you're often asked to enter your email to get their newsletter and save 10% or 15% on your seed order. And I like getting the newsletters. There's good information from all these different sources. But in one of those newsletters from one of these big companies, it said, now is the time to start your tomatoes. And, and I was shocked. And we've already talked a little bit about that today, how... It is all based on your last frost date and your weather patterns and your climate as to when you're going to be putting your tomatoes outside and you shouldn't be starting them indoors too early. And so the issue and the reason I was distressed is you had this source of normally pretty good information just broadcasting that now is the time to start tomato seeds. Well, be careful about that. Recognize that all of these, these experts or seed companies that are recommending when you do something, it's often skewed to their specific garden. And so this seed company comes from an area with warmer weather. The soil is already warm enough to be worked. And they're just a couple months away from starting their tomatoes. So yes, for them right now is the time to start tomato seeds. But it isn't for the, most of the rest of us that have been talking about how cold it is right now in our gardens. So I've said this before, you'll hear me say it again. Just be careful about the advice you see about gardening, especially when it tells you when to do something because there are just so many variables like the long range weather forecast and the short term forecast and what's actually happening in our garden. And even I do try to generalize the information, as I said earlier, I try to avoid giving a specific date that is the same for everybody because it rarely is. 
And so when somebody tells you specific information about how and when to do something, take a step back and stop and analyze and think and try to figure out if that's really best for you. And then I recommend you get a second opinion. Somebody who actually is growing in your area, maybe with more experience, which is why you're asking the question. And so rather than just accept, now's the time to start your tomato seeds, ask your neighbor who grows tomatoes. Are they starting their tomato seeds? And if not, when are they starting their tomato seeds? I would rather take information from the gardener that is growing next door to me than to take the information of some recognized expert on YouTube because the gardener who's growing next to me, who's had a garden for 20 years, probably knows better about what's going to work for me in my garden. So I just wanted to throw out that warning to you all because I'm seeing more and more videos like that. I'm seeing more and more newsletters with that kind of information and it doesn't match my garden. If it doesn't much match my garden, it probably doesn't match your garden either. So just be careful about that. Maureen O'Donnell, thank you so much for that contribution. Always nice to see support for the channel. I thank you so much for that. And Two Gals Vermont with a beautiful garden. Thank you for that super sticker. I appreciate that, Gail. And I, as you saw from the comments, I hope everyone is, is loving your garden. And I'm glad that you shared it with us today and that we could and encourage lots of other gardeners with some of your wonderful ideas of how you're doing it. And Jeanette, thank you for that super sticker. I appreciate that as well. Always nice to have you all here, and it's so nice to see the support that you're offering to the channel. It, it, it enables me to, to do a lot more. It enables me to get some of these things that I'm showing in videos and the, 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 the tools and the equipment. And so supporting the channel definitely gives me options to try new things to show you and, and make the videos about, because you never know what you'll discover on YouTube. I know, it's a crazy place, amazing information. But you do have to be careful about which of that information you use in your own garden. So knowing that you have to be careful, I hope you move forward with the, the cold weather that we're having. Use this time as well to learn about your spring garden, to learn about your plants, to learn about your seeds, to learn what you need to know as we go into this garden season. I love doing that on cold, snowy days and it gives you a chance to still stay immersed in gardening without actually getting out and getting your fingers dirty. Hey, let's do this again next Monday. I hope you have a great gardening week. I hope you learn a lot about gardening as you venture out and try to get some of that information and bring it back and share it as we chat. Same time, same place next Monday. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.